Hey, welcome along to another video edition of Mark's Mailbox. These are questions that came in uh, from Mark's Sign Club members when we were live in audio around the planet. Uh, but because we're live, we didn't get to them all, and some of them are pretty good, and so I thought we'd do a video bonus, uh, as is our occasional want. Uh, first one comes from Carl Chambers. This is in reference to that, those scenes of uh, life in Portland. One of those fantastic liberal cities that they make hip television shows about. And it looks all great when you're on the TV show and it seems fine and cool. Uh, but then when you're on the streets in real life, uh, you got uh, mobs menacing uh, motorists. I like the word motorists. Nobody says it enough in uh, America. But if Jeeves was driving Bertie Wooster through the streets of Portland, Oregon, uh, they would be motoring and they would be set upon by goons and thugs telling them they can't go down that street. And Carl Chambers says, as for the Antifa thugs stopping cars, I now carry a length of closet pole in my car and will buy bear spray tomorrow. I shall not be chased down my own streets. Uh, preach it, Carl, preach it. But he adds uh, cautiously, of course, if the thug is injured, I will be the one in shackles. You got that right, Carl. Uh, what we're seeing is that uh, Democrat mayors in these cities are letting thugs take over the streets according to whether uh, the thugs' ideological objectives accord with the mayors. Uh, that's not actually how you're meant to do things in civilized societies. Democrats did that in the Old South, of course, uh, when uh, they let uh, uh, the old Ku Klux Klan do some of their dirtier work. And now they're bringing the same basic strategy to parts of Cascadia and the Pacific Northwest. What's, what's underlying all this, though? Uh, that's what I wanted to talk about today. And we've got some questions, interesting questions on that. Dan writes, Hi, Mark. Do you think Angela Merkel was hardwired to believe in a supranational philosophy, now defunct, I think you mean communism there, and has therefore chosen Islam as the way ahead for German hegemony, or even that one must always have an overarching non-national, non-cultural narrative always. An earlier German leader thought so, says Dad. Well, if you're referring to uh, the late Herr Hitler, um, he, he, he wanted uh, Germany to expand its borders because it needed Lebensraum, living room, uh, because he wanted all these uh, nice young uh, German Fräulein uh, to find some nice young lad in the lederhosen and, and have tons of nice little Aryan boys uh, so they could sing Tomorrow Belongs to Me, as in the famous scene in Cabaret. Uh, and that was the idea. You needed Lebensraum because there were uh, going to be lots of Germans, so they needed to expand the borders of their country. No nation, no nation in the developed world, except possibly Japan, uh, is in less need of Lebensraum uh, than Germany uh, right now. It's got absolutely collapsed birth rates. And so Angela Merkel, as you know, led in all these strapping young uh, Muslim men to be the children Germany couldn't be bothered having themselves. And I think that's actually the more interesting point of this, not the supranational thing. Um, I think there's a general antipathy towards the idea of the nation state at the highest levels of the European Union. Uh, but there's also a, a, an antipathy to what you might call Christendom or traditional uh, values and uh, traditional models, uh, demographic models. They talk about post-Christian Europe. It was, it was striking me year, uh, about uh, uh, 15 years ago. Uh, I was uh, at a meeting with a lot of European Union big shots, and they started using the term post-Christian Europe. And I'd actually used that term, post-Christian Europe, and I'd used it uh, in a rather mordant, ironic way. And this was at the time of the European Union talks about the European Constitution, so-called. And all these guys were using post-Christian Europe uh, as if it was a good thing, and everyone should instantly recognize it was a good thing. Well, one consequence of that is that birth rates uh, have collapsed in Germany and elsewhere, and Angela Merkel uh, is, in fact, importing uh, Islam to be the future uh, that Germany would not otherwise have. And it's uh, sad, that. It's pathetic. 
Um, and yet, if you were to ask Angela Merkel, or even those Germans opposed to Angela Merkel, what exactly is wrong with Germany extinguishing itself and essentially becoming just a bit of real estate with great infrastructure that an entirely different society will be moving into, people wouldn't actually be able to uh, articulate why it is they actually object to that. So we're going to try and work that out a bit ourselves. Jill Felsen writes, Hi, Mark. Though they're quite different, the recent books by Douglas Murray, Jonah Goldberg, and Jordan Peterson seem to me to share a common theme of something like, we need to really value, protect, cling to, and defend the great, important, and civilizing values that we have inherited from our Judeo-Christian past, even if we can no longer be actual believers. Jonah, for his part, tries to leave religion out of it, but still says it was a miracle that we got these values. Uh, Douglas Murray comes the closest, though I'm probably misreading him, to saying even if we don't have faith, we should fake it because otherwise we're lost. Do you think a secular Western civilization can survive uh, without the religious faiths that created it? I don't see the slightest sign of that happening. This was underscored in your interview with the Irish filmmakers who pointed to how suddenly Ireland succumbed to secularism and then went crazy for abortion, uh, best uh, Jill. Uh, that was Anne McElhenney and Phelan McAleer, the makers of the Gosnell film. They're Irish. And uh, we were talking about how Ireland, uh, the modern Irish state, which was uh, actually invented, for better or worse, by uh, Eamon uh, de Valera uh, approximately uh, 85, 90 years ago, and created very much in his own image, uh, or to put it another way, in the opposite image uh, to uh, England and London. And Eamon de Valera succeeded in imposing his vision uh, of a uh, Catholic Irish state upon uh, 26 uh, Irish counties very successful. And it endured a, a long time, even after the rest of Europe had wholly secularized. Uh, Ireland uh, was still something of a holdout. Now it's, uh, you know, all gay, all Muslim, all abortion, uh, all the time. So it's looking very much like any other cookie cutter uh, Western European country. But the big question here, those books you mentioned, and I haven't read them all, but I've read uh, Douglas's book, and he's very thoughtful about that. Douglas is not a believing Christian, but he hopes he wants people to recognize that there is a utilitarian aspect uh, to the Christian faith that has nothing to do with whether you believe that Jesus Christ is your savior or anything like that. Uh, and that's all very well. In fact, the old Church of England used to be like that. Before they got hot for gays and climate change and all the other modish stuff, uh, the, the Church of England was a very good church for people who really didn't believe terribly much uh, but like to uh, like the language of the King James Bible and a couple of uh, old hymns for 40 minutes on a Sunday morning from time to time. And, it, and in that sense, it's a good kind of uh, civilizational backstop to lean on. There's not a lot of evidence, Jill, just to be serious about this. All societies need some kind of transcendent value. Uh, and religion is usually the easiest one to latch onto for that. If you have a hyper-rationalist society, uh, what you tend to end up with is what the European Union is. You have a present tense society. You, ha you create utopia for one uh, generation only. Uh, healthy functioning societies are a compact between the present and the past and the future. And you need all three present. Um, and uh, as Tom Wolfe put it, that's the great stream of uh, societal continuity. And Europe stepped out of the stream. Um, and we, we, so when we talk about those components to a healthy attitude towards the here and now, we're in the moment. We're here. It's whatever day it is here. I don't know what it is. It's Tuesday. It's what, you, what year were we? 2013? I don't know. 2027? Whatever we are. We're here and now in the present moment. But a healthy person has a sense of where he comes from and where he's going. Do we have a sense of where we come from? No, we don't. We, we, uh, we revile anyone who's older than 
Justin Bieber or Miley Cyrus. We can't comprehend them. They had the wrong views on gay marriage and transgendered bathrooms. So they got to be disowned. And if there's a statue of them, we got to tear it down. So we had that boob, uh, the astronaut, Scott Kelly, who cited Winston Churchill. And everybody uh, beats him to a pulp and says, you can't quote Winston Churchill because he's a racy, racy, racist. And Scott Kelly, who's a brave man and he's done something that you or I will never do. He's gone up there to the spheres and he's floated around planet Zongo where everybody's far saner than they are on planet Earth. And they're an advanced society. And so they don't have Twitter up there on planet Zongo. He's done that. He's been into space. But he's not man enough to stand up to the Twitter pansies clubbing him to a pulp for having the nerve to quote Winston Churchill, who was born before Justin Bieber and Miley Cyrus and therefore is verboten because we live in a present tense culture. And the only uh, famous person, as we mentioned earlier, from before Justin Bieber and Miley Cyrus is Hitler. So everybody old is Hitler. And so we are, eventually everybody's Hitler. And as I said before, when everybody's Hitler, nobody's Hitler. And we've now got the absolute reductio of that in that Scott Kelly controversy, because now Churchill is Hitler. That's how stupid we are. Churchill is Hitler. And it's not just that when you have no interest in anybody born before Miley Cyrus or Justin Bieber, um, it's not just that you're discarding the famous people uh, you're discarding Churchill and Hitler and the Duke of Wellington and Napoleon. It's not just that you're getting rid of all the big shots. You're actually getting rid of who you are. You're getting rid of your grandfather. You're getting rid of your great-great-grandfather. You're getting rid of your great-great-great-grandmother. You're severing yourself from your own inheritance. So, in the compact of a healthy society, a compact between the present and the past and the future, we've sliced off the past. We have nothing to learn from these guys. Because they were all wrong. They were wrong on the gay marriage and the transgender bathroom. So, Churchill, pff, to hell with him. Got nothing to learn from any of those guys. So, we're cut off from our past. What about the future? All over the Western world, we have these collapsed birth rates. Uh, where nobody is interested. We have upside down family trees. Even the people who have children tend to have one designer yuppie baby uh, at the age of 40. If you uh, take uh, formerly fecund Mediterranean cultures, uh, they ha now have uh, upside down family trees where um, uh, basically if you look at the Greeks or the Spaniards, they're basically halving with every new generation. So we've stepped out of the stream of historical continuity between the past, the present, and the future, that compact. And Douglas Murray understands uh, that that can't go on. That at a certain point, uh, as I said in America alone 12 years ago now, the future belongs to those who show up. And you can see the future that's showing up in any of Angela Merkel's German cities. Uh, the future that's showing up is not German. If you go to Swedish cities, if you go to Malmo, if you go to Gothenburg, the future that's showing up is not Swedish. If you go to all the cities down the spine of England, some of which are famous for all the wrong reasons, like Rotherham in Yorkshire, if you go to all those cities down the spine of England, the future that's showing up is uh, not English. Nicola Timmerman. Nicola Timmerman, who I had the pleasure of meeting on the inaugural Mark Stein Club cruise. And it was a delightful uh, pleasure to meet Nicola. And I hope to see Nicola again on the uh, next cruise. Nicola says, any comments about the decision by the Marseille Council, that's in southern France, in order to uh, not offend Muslims, they took the decision not to honor the French officer who volunteered to replace a hostage and was killed by a terrorist. This was a French policeman. It was a siege by the usual crazy Islamic loony of the day at a supermarket in Treb, which is near uh, the beautiful uh, fortress city of Carcassonne. 
And uh, at the supermarket, a brave, very brave French policeman, Arnaud Beltran, uh, offered to take the place of a female hostage. And he wound up dying in that siege. Colonel Beltram took four bullets. And uh, in the hospital at Carcassonne, he married his fiancée on his deathbed uh, because he understood that he wasn't going to live uh, to see their planned uh, June wedding. Um, and after his death, the French interior minister, Gérard Colomb, tweeted, I want to make sure we get this right, Monsieur Colomb tweeted, Le lieutenant colonel Arnaud Beltram nous a quitté. Mot pour la patrie, jamais la France. N'oubliera son héroïsme, sa braveur, son sacrifice. And if you don't understand my lousy schoolroom French, that means Lieutenant Colonel Arnaud Beltram has left us. He died for his country. France will never forget his heroism, his bravery, his sacrifice. And I said at the time, I wonder if that is true. I wonder if even Monsieur Colomb will remember his name in the years ahead. Uh, well, we know the answer to that now. That was just a few months ago. We know the answer now. They won't remember his name in Marseille because the Marseille Municipal Council is too scared to name a street after him after a French hero who, according to Monsieur Colomb, died for his country. And a man who died for his country cannot have a street named after him in one of the biggest cities in that country, in the port city of Marseille, because it will provoke so-called French, quote-unquote, Muslims. As I said, the future belongs to those who show up for it, and the future that's showing up in France is not French. Um, Laura Rosen-Cohen, we've had a lot of questions on abortion because uh, of my interview with Anne and Phelan about their splendid new Gosnell movie. Laura Rosen-Cohen says, Mark, do you think it's noteworthy that the latest royal baby cooking along is called the royal baby already? This is uh, their royal highnesses, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. Don't you just love a royal baby story? Royal baby this, royal baby that. Uh, and, uh, and Laura points out that other babies at that stage are considered clumps of cells that are expendable and murderable. Struck me as rather odd, especially with all the news about the Gosnell movie this week. Uh, no one talks about the royal fetus. And that's true, and it's uh, striking that. The Duchess of Sussex, uh, the former Miss Meghan Markle, uh, in theory, and we know how from the, their nuptials, uh, with her and Prince Harry, how go-ahead and trendy and with it the royal family is these days. Uh, they haven't yet reached the stage where uh, Her Royal Highness, at uh, eight months, three weeks and six days, is going along to Dr. Gosnell's clinic and asking uh, if uh, he can perform one of his uh, post-birth, partial birth abortions. Uh, and they can be and they can be totally cool. And uh, she can be the first royal duchess to exercise a woman's right to choose. It's interesting to me. We still talk about royal babies. We still regard it in that quaint old phrase as a blessed event. Uh, as something devoutly to be wished for. In an age uh, when uh, we're getting near uh, effectively a, a state ideology of formal barrenness. Uh, when the United Kingdom, uh, when Ireland, when Germany, uh, when France, uh, when multiple European states are, are governed by a statistically improbable percentage of childless leaders, we still cheer a royal baby and we don't call it a royal fetus. That's an, that's an interesting point. Rich says, remove the politicized emotions and the racial purity arguments now taking place may be the comedic highlight of Trump's first term. A true theater of the absurd. Kanye West is no longer a real black man because he likes Trump, but Senator Warren possibly had a Native American family member between 125 and 300 years ago, so she may as well be Sacagawea, and you're a racist if you think otherwise. 
As with all great comedy, there are some elements of tragedy, the most pathetic being establishment media attacking actual Cherokee chiefs for performing their rain dance all over Warren's DNA test. You, you know, Rich, the interesting thing about this is we, th those of us on this side of the aisle, I think it's faintly ridiculous that, that uh, Elizabeth Warren is one 1,024th Native American, supposedly, according to this test, which is actually less than the average. Even without intending to, you can be one 1,024th Native American, never even know it, never even occur to you. It suddenly would not occur to you to do what Elizabeth Warren did, which is when you're uh, 1,023, 1,024ths white, you are nevertheless eligible to be Harvard Law School's first woman of color. This is the stupidity, of course, of identity politics, but it, as again, as I always say, it's the Leninist thing. Who whom? What matters is who is doing what to whom? Once you know the labels to be applied to the participants in any dispute, then you know who are the good guys and who are the bad guys. And that's why Kanye West, who's been subjected to actually some of the most blatant racist uh, commentary on MSNBC and, uh, and CNN and so forth, because he happens to be a black man who went along to see Trump in the White House and had a good time, apparently. So he ceased to be black. Just like Sarah Palin, when uh, she ran with McCain uh, 10 years ago, ceased to be female. Uh, just like uh, a chap I used to like reading on the Twitters. Gay patriot. He was a conservative gay. He was a gay of conservative disposition. So he ceased to be gay. So Twitter could toss him off Twitter. Uh, they could de-gay Twitter as far as gay patriot is concerned. Um, because he's not the right kind of gay. So if you're not the right kind of gay, you're not gay at all. You're just a pathetic, hapless straight. If you're not the right kind of woman, you're not female at all. You're really just like, might as well be a dead white male. If you're the coolest, hippest, blackest rapper on the planet, but you say something nice about Trump, you're not black at all. You're, you're not Kanye West. You might as well be Andy Williams. You might as well be the Partridge family. You're not black anymore. Uh, and, and on the other hand, uh, if you're uh, on the other side of the ledger, who the hell wants to be white? White are the bad guys. You switch on The View any moment, and all these people are suddenly going on about all the, in, in the Brett Kavanaugh thing, about all the uh, old white men uh, on the Republican Judiciary Committee. Uh, it, I mean, there's no racist, uh, racial element to this thing. It was like a white woman from the same background, from a neighboring school as the white guy being judged by, there's no race element to it. But all these actually, you know, getting up there, white women on The View, keep going on about the white men on the Republican Judiciary Committee, those bozos in the streets of Portland. Uh, they're, they're denouncing the car drivers who won't uh, obey their blocking the streets as, oh, you're a nice little whitey, whitey, whitey. They don't seem aware that they're, they're white. I never used to believe in the whole fluoride in the water conspiracy, but there seem now to be millions of actual white, pasty-faced, Caucasian Americans who seem entirely unaware that they're white, that they're as boringly white as anybody, as any white male on the white male Republican on the Senate Judiciary Committee. Toby Pilling, as an addendum to that, says, are hate crimes one of the worst results of promoting an identity culture? If everyone is not equal before the law, does not such injustice actually breed resentment and hate, the opposite of that which is purportedly intended? You are absolutely right there, Toby. That's one reason, you know, with the Brett Kavanaugh thing, we kept saying uh, on, on our side of the line, well, whatever happened to the presumption of innocence? Whatever happened to equality before the law? Nobody cares about that anymore. The approved identity groups matter. Uh, and that's why we have people like that fraud Blumenthal, uh, the stolen honor twit, uh, who... who quite disgracefully, uh, the electors of Connecticut keep sending to the Senate, guy who pretended he was in Vietnam uh, when he was in, where he was, Hartford, Connecticut, 
uh, or New Haven, or wherever he was. Couldn't tell the New Haven, difference between New Haven and Saigon, apparently. It's a mistake anyone could make. Anyway, this guy, uh, he keeps going on, oh, I believe women. I believe women. So, it, so I have no idea why there's such a backlog in the U.S. courts. I've had these stupid cases stalled in the sclerotic dump of American justice in the D.C. Superior Court and some other stupid cockamamie case in uh, Nevada, wherever it is, uh, because stalled because all oh, the courts are so clogged. Why are they clogged? Senator Blumenthal says, if you know that uh, party A is a woman and party B is a man, party A wins. If party A is a gay and party B is an evangelical Christian, party A, the gay guy, wins. If party A is a gay and party B is Muslim, oh, wait, wait a minute, that all gets a bit more complicated, and we'll get back to you later on that. Identity culture, uh, as Toby says, it doesn't actually breed resentment and hate. It presupposes it. It makes it a... Uh, it, it, it essentially makes it inevitable uh, because we're actually deciding things based on how we label people, which is vile, actually. Vile. Uh, but we're going to have a uh, lot more of it. Thank you very much. Oh, have we got time for any more? Quick, let's see if we've got any time. Oh, Kate Smythe says, in the advertisement, Kate, Kate's from Australia. So they say, I think they say, uh, adver they say advertisement down there. Wait, what do they say in America? Ad advertisement, is that right? Advertisement? I don't know. Advertisement, advertisement. In the advertisement for the Adorable Deplorables tour, uh, Dennis Miller and I are coming to a town near you. Well, actually, we're probably not. But if you're in Pennsylvania and Western New York, uh, we're coming to a town near you. We're doing a little mini tour of uh, Rochester and uh, Syracuse and Reading, Pennsylvania and a couple of other places. Uh, in the advertisement, Mark Stein and Dennis Miller both have beards. Will Mark's beard be reanimated for the tour in 2019? I accidentally shaved my beard off while I was on French soil. Don't know why. Uh, and then when I came back on Tucker Carlson, it was a bit of a crisis. And because uh, I, I left it too late to grow back. And I was wondering whether I should get rid of it all completely, have the 1980s uh, designer stubble thing that... Uh, George Michael used to have when he sang Wake Me Up Before You Go Go and all that kind of thing. And I was all a bit confused about it, didn't quite know what to do. We had one of these conferences. I hadn't really noticed it until 15 minutes before I went on air with Tucker Carlson and the hair and makeup ladies were uh, standing around me uh, trying to decide whether they should, you know, paint on a real, a, fo a fake beard like the bad guy in the old Charlie Chaplin movies used to, uh, uh, to wear with uh, just painted straight on black. Um, and then uh, they were deciding whether they want, and I was all in a panic about that because Geraldo, the great Geraldo, um, had actually uh, put on, uh, what was that thing, uh, the beard thing, just for men? He'd, he'd noticed his, be his beard uh, had, uh, it was showing a little bit too much gray, so he put all the, uh, put the just for men on and then the telephone rang, and so he goes and answers the telephone and he's talking to his broker for 20 minutes. <laughs> And he forgets he's left the just for men on. You mustn't leave it on more than three minutes. So he went on with this like helmet of black. And I was like, no, 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 I don't want to be like, be like Geraldo. So I haven't reached a decision on the beard. The pro beard and anti beard forces are too close to call at the moment. It's a bit like some of these Senate races. It's a bit like Bill Nelson in Florida. It's a bit like Ted Cruz in Florida. The pro beard, anti beard forces are all within the margin of error. So if you have a preference, whether you'd like to see me looking all baby face, whether you'd like to see me uh, with a proper full manly beard. I don't, I'm not saying I'm going to go the full Ayatollah. Uh, not, not saying that. I don't know about the full Ayatollah, but I might go like the full assistant choreographer on Hello Dolly, something like that. Uh, then do let me know which you prefer. And I don't want any third party options. I'm not having this designer stubble. That You can't really do it. They had like a Don Johnson Miami Vice razor in the 80s where you just like scraped, scraped, you scraped it and it left you with three days. It was a special thing. 
and it, you can't, they haven't remade it, you can't get the parts now for it. There's no tech support for it, there's been no tech support for it since 1992, so I'm not going to go the designer stubble route. Um, so do let me know about that, and uh, beard is the most important thing, uh, collapse of Western civilization, uh, the end of Christendom in Europe, uh, the demographic death spiral, uh, the rise of Islam, these are all peripheral issues, but do let me know where you stand on the critical beard issue, because I need some help on that. This is Mark Stein, we will be back in audio and video to answer your questions next time. See you then.